welcome. It's been a good day already. Amen. I uh, hopefully have things a little more composed than the first service. I was a wreck up here the first service, I tell you. Um, as, as I told you guys, Pastor Mark's uh, not well, and so um, I, I didn't start putting this together until yesterday. And, and I told the first service, I, I, I wonder if maybe we get things backwards sometimes, right? I don't know. We, we do things the way we do them. Why? Because we've always done them that way. I'm just going to share something that, that happened to me. Like So into last night, I was looking at this passage and, and, and putting things together. And you'll see here pretty quickly that it's pretty much just this passage, right? And that, that's a good thing, right? It's not going to be anything I have. But, but as to spend time in this passage and then to come right in here this morning and to have worship based on what, what I've, I've just been digging in over the, really the hours before, I'm telling you guys, the, the worship is powerful, powerful for me. And I'm just thinking, boy, sometimes maybe, maybe we ought to come in and just preach first, all right? Preach, preach God's word first and let God's word just just get into us a little bit and then and, and then worshiping instead of worrying about whether we're going to get a seat down to the Applebee's I'm not going to get on you hard about that all right but I ain't saying I'm going to let you out early so you're going to get a seat at the Applebee's all right so hey God's good God's good all right hey guys I, I want to let everybody know that I, I know Miss Marion's here and we lost one of our own yesterday morning, and Brother Mike Painter um, went home to be with, with the Lord. And I know it's hard, and his family's here. Um, but I would tell you, there's hope, right? How, how do we have hope? Because I know where Mike's at right now, right? Now, he's with the Lord. He's with the Lord. And uh, there's these old bodies are just bodies, right? We're a soul that happens to have a body. You ever thought about that, right? We happen to have a body. This body ain't gonna, gonna live forever, right? But your soul will. And Mike's, 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 he's, he's with the Lord right now. And I, I, I'm excited for him. I'm excited for him. And you might say, well, that's, that's cold. No, it ain't. I'm excited for Brother Mike. He's with the Lord because I know he knew him as his Savior. And so, if you get an opportunity, please love on his family. We love them to death. Um, be there for them this week as they go through and they walk this out, right? Um, we care deeply for them. And so, uh, just wanted to make sure everybody uh, knew that. All right, so we're going to get into to God's Word. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27 today. So, if you've been going through Foundations 260, you know, guys, we've... We started at the beginning, and, and man, we are in the life of Christ, and we're getting down to the end of the life of Christ. We're getting really close to the crucifixion. Um, we're not going to get all the way there today. We're going to get right to the, to the prefaces of it. So we're going to get right to that point. And today we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. Um, well, I pulled my eyeballs out, and I'm, I'm dropping stuff everywhere. So I'll kick those to the side. I already had to move Mark's chair over because I'm too big to have that and that and me and too much on the stage, right? So, uh, but hey, we're we're in we're in chapter 27 and we're at the the point where he's going to be in front of Pilate, okay? And today's the the title of the sermon. I didn't change the title of the sermon that Pastor Mark had. I didn't change the points that he had. We're we're still going to do, one thing that helps in a church like us, we do expository preaching. We just go through a passage of scripture, right? And you know what uh, I was tasked with? Going through a passage of scripture. That's pretty liberating, right? Because we're going to go through a passage of scripture. And that's what we're going to do. And God's going to speak to us. So we're going to go through this. But as we saw, the, 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 the crowd or Christ, who are you following? That's the, that's the title. And that's really what it comes down to. We have to make choices in our life we make lots of choices i think last time i preached a few weeks ago i talked about being down to the cup of joy down in uh, uh brookfield over in brookfield the coffee shop and i'm their number one advertiser i don't get free coffees or nothing i still pay when i go up there 
Uh, but if you get a chance to go over there, it's a wonderful place. It really is. And uh, just a great atmosphere, uh, Christian music, old-timey Christmas, Christian music on there. But again, I still, I get, what kind of coffee do I drink? You guys know me? Black coffee. That's right. The way God made it. <laughs> Amen. Black coffee. All right, so I drink black coffee. So I sat there, and it amazes me. Again, every week, I, these people get up there, and there's all these different choices. And I thought about it a little bit this week. They're getting up there, and they got all these choices, all these different flavors. You put vanilla or caramel or, or chocolate or, or all the other stuff, right? All, the, what's, all these choices. And I thought it's kind of like even how kind of church can get all mixed up. There's, there's a whole bunch of flavors of church. You guys notice that? All right, a whole bunch of flavors of church. But when you boil it down, you're really making a choice. You're either going to get coffee or you're not going to get coffee. If you boil it down to just the crux of it, right? And so if we would get rid of, this is my advocate for black coffee. <laughs> I didn't get it. There must be some foo-foo coffee drinking people out there because you didn't like when I talked all the bad things about all the different flavors, right? This is black coffee. It's God's word. And if we'll boil it down to this, all the other stuff is all those funky things they put in good coffee. <laughs> Amen. Do I have one black coffee drinker out there? <laughs> Amen. There's a few. I don't have to see you at the altar today, but the rest of you. <laughs> Stick with the Word of God, guys. You can't go wrong with the Word of God. Just this. Not what some man said. God's Word, right? Amen. God's Word and black coffee. I can't tell you it's the key to long life, <laughs> but it'll go a long ways for, for joyful life. That's why they call that the cup of joy, and it's black coffee in that, by the way. <laughs> all right. So we all have choices. Now, the folks here today, we're going to see they got, they got a choice, and it really, it's, it's not all the other stuff that's out there. The choice is really between, will I follow Jesus or not, Right? That's, that's going to be their, their choice, and we all have to make a choice ourselves. Everyone here today, you, you're going you're gonna to make this choice about what am I going to do with Jesus. You've heard me say that a lot of times. It's coming, you, everybody here is going to make a determination what you're going to do with Jesus. You're either going to place your faith and trust in him or you're not. There is no middle ground. In America today, we love to have the gray area and carve out and have all the middle ground. Guys... The Word of God is clear. There is no middle ground on this. So, uh, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about the setting where we're at. So, so Christ, we're going to start the reading where, where Jesus is in front of Pilate. But just prior to this, the, the night before was when, when he was betrayed by Judas, right? The soldiers took him away, the, 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 the Sanhedrin's guard, and they, they took him to Caiaphas, right? So, he was in front of the Sanhedrin or the High Council, whatever your version of the Bible what it says, but it's the same thing. It's, the, it's that group of leaders. And so he was tried before them, <clears throat> and, and they were brutal, guys. The, the Bible is clear in the Gospels that he was hit um, repeated times. He was spit on. He was despised by them. And they wanted to kill him. But there's one thing that they didn't have because they weren't in charge was the Romans were in charge, and they couldn't kill him. That had... The Romans had to be the ones that, that could do that. And so that's why they've got him over here at Pilate. Pilate is the, the Roman governor at the time. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, so let's look at the proposition for today. We're going to enter the courtyard of the governor, Pontius Pilate, and be given the same two options as the folks that were there. Guys, you are the crowd today. All right? Just imagine yourself. You're out there in the crowd. And you're going to be given two options today. Will you listen to the crowd or are you going to follow Jesus? That's what you're going to, your options are going to be. So let's look at Matthew 27. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14 to get us going. 
And now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him, and Jesus replied, You have said it. But when the leading priests and the, the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges that they're bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, I pray that your word would speak to us today. Show us something from your word. Show us personally, each one of us, something from your word today. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So in your outline, first thing that's there, rejected by Pilate. We read the first few verses there already. He's standing in front of Pilate. So Pilate is looking at Jesus, this man, and what does he see? Sometimes I think we forget about what Christ looked like at this time, right? So Jesus has been over. He's already, what I say? He's already been beaten, right? He's been spit on. He, he's, a, he's in rough-looking condition. And here's Jesus standing in front of Pilate. I just have this idea whenever I see the question here in verse 11 now Jesus was standing before Pilate the Roman governor said are you the king of the Jews I think he looked at him like you don't look like a king to me you don't look like somebody that's gonna you okay, first of all Pilate would have known everything's going on in the city guys he would have known everything that was going on in the city and he would have looked at Jesus, I think, and said, this doesn't look like a guy that's uh, going to overthrow things around here. This guy's been beaten up by the Jewish people. They hadn't even seen the, the Roman soldiers yet. We see that he looks at him, and he's thinking, oh, I'm, in a, I'm in a tough spot. See, see, Pilate was a politician. Now, I'm not going to get in politics right now, all right? So you can take a breath. No politics. I'm going to talk Roman politics for just a second. The Romans were not much different than us. There were people that liked to be in power. At this time, Pilate had been in power in this area for around 10 years, right? Now, in, in our, our country today, there might be people that have been uh, senators or whatever. They might have been senators or, or in, in power in their state. 30, 40 years is not uncommon. 10 years in the Roman government, that was a long time because you, it was basically a zero defect organization. You messed up. You had to go back to Rome, and that was the end of you, right? They replaced you. And so Pilate was pretty good at walking the fence, figuring things out. He'd had a few missteps. Um, <clears throat> he he kind of got the, the Jews all wound up a few times. Now keep in mind, if you're a, a, a Roman governor of an area, you need to keep the people appeased because you have a certain number of soldiers, and then there's everybody else that lives there. Who outnumbers who? The people outnumbered the soldiers, right? And so you better keep them appeased. And so that's what the Romans were always pretty good at. But Pilate, a couple times, had already got him wound up over different things. He'd had some problems with, he liked to, the Romans liked to have idols and different images. And one time he marched all of the soldiers into Jerusalem with eagles, the big eagle, the Roman eagle on their staffs. And that, he had no idea what was going to happen. But the Jews, that was... I was, you don't come into Jerusalem with these, these images, and it caused an uprising. And he, he had to, to kind of back that down. And then he decided he wanted running water. We all like running water, right? But, but Pilate, back in this time, that was kind of a, that was an upgrade at the facility for, for running water. And so he wanted to build aqueducts, right? And so he did this, and he used the tax money first, but then when he ran out, where do you think he looked? The treasury. How do you think that went over with the Jewish people? He robbed from God, folks. He robbed from God, and he took it, and he built the, he built the aqueducts that didn't go over well, and so he had to kind of quell those riots. So he, I want you to understand the picture. He's already had a couple times where the people have risen up. If he's wanting to stay in power, he's got to make sure that he doesn't cause an uprising. And by the way, right now, we're at Passover. 
Are there a few outsiders in town during the Passover? Yes. Yeah, all of them are there, right? right. Every, the Jews come from all over, right? They're, they're, they're everywhere. And so there's a lot of people he definitely doesn't want to cause an uprising right now. So those are some things to, to keep in mind. He's kind of in a, a tough spot at this point in time. And so Pilate already is looking at him. He's not really too scared about Jesus. And he basically just discounts him. The second thing that we're going to see is we're going to spend some time here on the people. Let's look at verse 15. Christ was deserted by his own people. These are the people that he came to, the Jews, right? We know that he came for, for all of us, but these, these are his people. Verse 15, now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted and this, <clears throat> this year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. And as the crowds gathered uh, before Pilate's house at, the, at that morning, he asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. And just then, as Pilate was sitting at the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. And so the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. And Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. And Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. And so he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am, an in, uh, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death. We and all our children. So we see this passage here where he offers immediately this prisoner named Barabbas. So let's talk just for a minute about who, who he's offering up as, as Barabbas and why he would do that. So Barabbas, is uh, we see in the other Gospels, John says that, that he was a thief uh, or a robber, depending on what version you look at. It's the same thing. Mark says that he was a rebel and a murderer, an insurrectionist, right? And a murderer. And Matthew says that here he's a notorious prisoner. The bottom line is, guys, he's a troublemaker. He needed to be in jail. He deserved the sentence that he had already been given. It was, uh, he had earned that. And kind of the irony here is we've got Jesus who's on trial. What is the Sanhedrin saying? Because they have no, no, nothing that can be punishable by death, they have to say that he's a, he's a rebel. He's trying to overthrow the Romans. So the charge against Jesus is being a rebel or an insurrectionist which is the actual charge that Barabbas is convicted of, amongst many other things. Isn't that something? Jesus is being charged with the thing that Barabbas actually did. Let's look at some of these verses. We're going to spend just a minute on some of these verses as we go. Let's look at, at the crowd. Now, now, Pilate, as he sees, his feeling is he saw the way Jesus came into the city, Right? So remember, if we go back just a little ways, how did Christ, how was it when Christ came into the city, right? Palm branches on the ground, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so Pilate is a guy that knows what's going on in his town. He's thinking, you know what, I'm going to offer him up Jesus and they'll take Jesus because I know that there's, they, they want him. He doesn't want at this time uh, to, uh, uh, to turn Christ over to be crucified. Verse 16, we'll go there and we're going to look for a minute. It says uh, He says that we have this man named Barabbas, and as the crowds gathered before Pilate's house, he says, which one do you want me to release you, Barabbas or Jesus, the Messiah? He, he's thinking this is going to be the way. We look down at verse 18, it says he knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Pilate sees through it, right? They're envious. The, the Sanhedrin, they're upset because... Now, Jesus has the fame they want. Jesus has the respect of the people that they want. Jesus 
has the people that are the notoriety that they want. Jesus is preaching against the stealing from the people, the stealing from God, the accumulations of all, of all the wealth. He is against everything that disrupts their way of life. And Pilate sees this, as we see in the scripture in verse 18. Look at verse 19. Just then, Pilate as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message. You guys remember a few weeks ago I preached and I talked about in the army, sometimes they send messages down, right? And there's uh, some of them we just listen to and then some of them, if they're from the right person, right? If Thunder 06 uh, sends something down, um, Lance knows what happens, right? You're answering that phone, right? And so I don't know what Pilate's wife's call sign was. But they said, household 06 sent a message. Pilate's, Pilate's holding court. I can tell you who's running this household right now, right? <laughs> this guy's supposed to be the governor of the area. He's holding court. Men's lives are in hand, and here comes the guy. Hey, household 06 got a message. He's like, hey, be back with you in a second, right? That's it. He's listening. So he's wanting to hear what his wife has to say. And, and men, by the way, that's the only thing you ever want to follow that Pilate does. <laughs> yeah, listen, listen to what, when the wife calls, you might want to answer that phone, right? <clears throat> now, I lost my, now I lost track. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a whole bunch of amens from the ladies there. <laughs> All right? So as this happens, right, she's telling him, I, I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. But look what happens, verse 20. Meanwhile, meanwhile, right? So there, Pilate's got things on hold, getting the message. The chief, the chief priests and all of them, they're going to take the opportunity. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. Hey, they know what's getting ready to happen. They can already see. And so they're like, hey, 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 here's, here's what we're going to do, right? Here's what we're going to do. We're gonna, when, when he turns around and says, who do you want? You're going to say Barabbas, right? We're going to say Barabbas. Have you guys ever been on the elementary playground where, where you got something and some, some knucklehead kid that I don't know why people listen to him, but everybody listens to him, and he gathers everybody around, and they say, hey, we're going we're gonna to do this. And for some reason, everybody says, okay. <laughs> Even though everybody knows it's the dumbest thing on earth. <laughs> Why do we do that? Why do we do that? I don't have any good answer. One is we're human, right? We're sinful people. Guys, when it comes down to, to things in life, careful who we follow. Careful who we're listening to. I could preach a whole nother sermon. I ain't going to go off on that one. But hey, they, they let these guys tell them, hey, yeah, yeah, let, let's have them release a murderer back out. So that's what happens right here. Let's go on. Look at verse 21. So then the governor asked again. He turned around after he's taken care of, of what his wife's got. Obviously, he's unfazed. He keeps going. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? The, the, the elders, they knew what was coming. All right, which one do you want me to release to you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas! I'm sure Pilate's like, what? I'm sure he wasn't wanting or thinking he was going to hear that. He probably didn't want to hear that because his wife had just told him what she told him. Pilate responded, <clears throat> then what should I do with Jesus who's called the Messiah? And they shouted back again, crucify him. They got it down, crucify him. They don't even hesitate. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. The question was, what crime has he committed? And what They're crucifying, they don't care. They'd made up their mind, crucify him. Guys, careful in life, when you get, you get things and you want something so bad, Holy Spirit's speaking to you in another way, and you just, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And we're seeing this here. Crucify him. Look at verse 22. Pilate responded. Sorry. Luke 23. But the mob roared even louder. Crucify him. And Pilate saw that he was getting, wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. 
So he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd. And he releases Barabbas. So Pilate released Barabbas to him. And he ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, and then he turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. We're going to come back to this in a moment. Let's go on to the soldiers. Christ is humiliated by the soldiers. I just read 26. Let's look at verse 27. Some of the Soviet governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. Guys, a regiment, if you, it says a regiment, yours, yours might say a company. It depends on, it's a lot of guys. A regiment is a couple of battalions in, in the Army, in the U.S. Army. I don't know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 men. A lot of men. They called everybody out. And so I want you to have understanding that when they bring all these men in, the things that I'm going to talk about here in a moment that happened to Christ, that wasn't just a couple of guys. I suspect every single one of them got their opportunity in there. That's a lot. And it helps paint the picture of what Christ did for us. Let's look at it. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And this is after they had scourged him, right? 40 lashes minus one, 39 of them. When he's whipped, that whip comes all the way around the side of him and it catches into the flesh on the side and it just tears all the way back. Many people didn't live through it. At this point, when we get down here, he's already been flogged. He's, he's a mess. He, he he's, looks nothing like a man. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And they wove thorn branches into a crown and they put it on his head and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him with, on the head with it. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. And then they led him away to be crucified. Guys, I want you to understand something. The Roman soldiers were no joke. All right? The Roman soldiers aren't the Afghan army of our world. Okay? Which don't man and fight. These guys from youth were trained for war. These are men that by this time, they're, they're men, they're in this part of Judea. They've seen nothing but war and torture and pain inflicted on others, and they're numb to it at this time. And these are strong men. And I will tell you what Christ went through is something that none of us, I'm confident, will ever experience. I pray that none of us do. Hey, if you, if you want to know how much God hates sin, Think about what he put Christ through. It's his own son. God hates sin. Yet we, we tend to do what we want. Pick and choose what's in God's word. And say, I want to go along my merry way and live my life. I can tell you, Jesus Christ, every lash that he took was for us. Every beating that he took, that was for us. And I know it's somber. And it's not easy sometimes to preach these messages. But you know what? They're in God's word and we need to hear them. We need to hear them. And the entire time he didn't say a word. Not a word. He can call down a legion of angels. And he doesn't even remain silent. For me and for you, he remained silent. Nothing. But in his silence... He's still teaching. He's still fulfilling prophecy. And, and I was going to have it put up. You don't even have to put it up on the screen. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. So you guys just hang on. Just, I want everybody to close your Bibles. Don't go to, don't, don't go to Isaiah. I'm going to read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. But I want you to read it in the light of what we've been, listen to it in the light of what we've been talking about today. 
I want you to listen to it. It's a, this is a prophecy from, from 700 years, roughly, before Christ's time. The time we're talking about in this passage, this is a scripture from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah prophecy. And I just want you to stop and I want you to hear it as I read it. It's not my word. It's God's word. And listen to it like that. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground, and there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own, and yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep is silent before the shears. He did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offspring for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he'll be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for he will bear all their sins. I will give him honor, the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. 700 years before we just read a passage. And it's not even done. When we get down, we're going to hear about where he's buried. Guys, he did that for us. He did it for us. Let's go to the walking point. Who you follow today will affect where you spend eternity tomorrow. The same question that, that Pilate posed. What are we going to do with Jesus, King of the Jews? That's the question to us sitting out there. I said you're in the, the crowd today. What, what's, what's your answer? What will you do? With Jesus, king of the Jews. Pilate, he got it wrong. He, he washed his hands. Guys, be careful of this. Uh, Pilate thought by washing his hands, that put him somewhere in the middle, right? That, that he wasn't, he really didn't do anything. Guys, I'm telling you, when it comes, there's only one answer, one way or the other, right? You either follow Jesus Christ or you don't. Pilate tried to wash his hands thinking, I'm going to walk the middle ground. There is no middle ground. When you wash your hands and say, I'm going to be in the middle, you are saying no to Jesus. That's it. A, a maybe is no. It's the same thing. It's either yes or no. If you want to say it's yes, maybe, no, it's yes or maybe, but maybe equals no. It's yes or no. Pilate got it wrong. The crowd got it wrong. They said crucify him. They know Barabbas is is a murderer, he's a killer, but yet they ask for him, right? And we know that Christ stands as a, he was a substitute for Barabbas. Let's think about this name, 
uh, uh, Barabbas. I'm not going to spend a ton of time. I can spend a lot of time on it. But Bar, in, in, when we see it in their language, Bar meant son of, right? Son of, and then Abba. Where do we hear that from? Abba. What's Abba mean? Abba the father, right? Son of the father. Who's the, who's the father of humans? Humans, Adam, right? It come down, we think of it. Just think of it in this way. We have a choice. You have Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. Or you have Barabbas. And who does he represent? He represents me. I'm Barabbas. You're Barabbas. We're all Barabbas. Every one of us. Jesus took the cross for all of us. Now, on that day, he physically took the cross for Barabbas. Let's think about Barabbas. That dude was in jail. And, and the third, you know what? The middle cross, that was for him. That was his cross that day. And can you imagine? He knows that the time's coming. And he hears the jailer comes down, and he unlocks the, the door, and he thinks, yep, this is the time. He maybe can even hear that. They're hollering for Barabbas out there. He's like, it's my time. It's time. They hate me. I'm going out there. And they unlock him and they lead him out. And he thinks this is the last time I'm going out. And he knows what he's about to endure. Hey, he knew what crucifixion was. He knew what he was about to walk into. And he walks out into that light. And he's there. And he looks and there's Jesus. And there's Pilate. And Pilate says... You're free. Can you imagine how Barabbas felt? He was condemned. It was his day to die, and he knew it. He was about to endure the pain, and Christ was there to take the cross for him. I hope you've felt the freedom. I see a few smiles out there right now. Some of you know because there was the day when you trusted in Christ and, and, and you were at rock bottom. You knew that you couldn't do it anymore. You knew that you were, you were a dead man walking and you knew it. And you accepted Christ. And you, and you accepted what he did for you on the cross. And I will tell you, you made that choice already. I'm thankful for that choice that many of you have made already today but it comes back to the start right who are you going to follow today who are you going to follow guys the bottom line is this each of us are going to make a decision who we're going to follow one way or the other the last walking point is this every person will walk out of here today either under the blood of Jesus or you're going to walk over the blood of Jesus. You're either going to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and accept the penalty that he paid on the cross for you. Or are you going to walk out and say, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to follow him. I pray that nobody would walk out of here today that way. We're going to take a time.